and visit the region. I hope that they would be invited by members of parliament for that purpose. We know there's no military solution to the problem in Turkey. In fact, the side has been fighting for decades and there has been no progress. Most recently because of the decision by President Erdogan to attack the Kurds without provocation. <coughs> Turkey must democratize and decentralize. It should negotiate with the HDP and specifically with the co-chairman Selahattin Demirtas, who will address this assembly later today. It's important that US officials, European officials, members of Congress and members of the European Parliament express publicly their concern about threats committed against the HDP to lift their diplomatic immunity as members of Parliament <coughs> and threaten to bring them to trial. Already the rule of law and the administration of justice in Turkey is highly questionable. Any efforts to prosecute HDP parliamentarians will further bury Turkey as anti-democratic and authoritarian. So the U.S. has a national interest in seeing all these things happen. It should look at the region and these countries in a balanced way, but also through a, a Kurdish lens. It wants to see stability and democracy and peace wherever Kurds reside. And there's a fundamental lesson to be drawn from this period in history. The U.S. has bent over backwards to try to placate its adversaries instead of fully supporting its friends. And its friends are the Kurds in Iraq, Syria, and Turkey. There's an adage, which you all know, that the Kurds have no friend but the mountains. Well, today, in these countries, the United States has no better friend than the Kurds. And instead of talking about it, we should start acting upon it. The decision announcement by Ash Carter is a good step in the right direction. Let's consolidate that with additional security assistance and political and diplomatic support. That would make us proud of the United States. It would make us more safe and secure as Kurds, our friends and our allies. So I thank you all for your attention. I look forward to questions. Thank you, Dr. Phillips, for your scholarly and radical speech, indeed. Uh, now the turn goes to uh, Lucy, please. Dear friends, um, thank you for this opportunity to, to speak out loud a little bit about Yazidis. So I will bring just numbers and ask what is the future of existence? In the event of August 3rd, 2014, so-called Islamic State, or ISIS, murdered more than 5,000 Yazidis, adopted 6,500 and sold over 4,500 Yazidi women and girls into sexual slavery. Over 186,000 children have been displaced. At that time, over 150,000 went to Kurdish regional government and more than 250,000 Yazidis were trapped on the Mount Sinjar where hundreds of Yazidis found their death in starvation and hunger. Donatella Rivera, Amnesty International Senior Crisis Response Advisor says, many of those held as sexual slaves are children, girls aged 14 and 15 years old or even younger. ISIS fighters are using rape as a weapon in attacks to war crimes and crimes against humanity. Yazidi women and girls have been forcibly married, sold, or given as gifts to ISIS fighters and supporters, and are often forced to convert <coughs> ISIS doctrine. Many girls have committed suicide. Yazidi boys are held at military training camps in Raqqa, Syria, the capital of the ISIS Caliphate. Boys between the age of 8 and 15 are given to military training and forced to watch the decapitations. In quotes, this is your initiation to jihad. They are told, you are an Islamic State boy now. 
On March 17, 2016, Secretary, State, Secretary of State John Kerry says that the United States has determined that ISIS action against Yazidi and other minority groups in Iraq and Syria constitutes genocide. Kerry said that in 2014, ISIS raped Yazidi, killed them, enslaved thousands of Yazidi women and girls, selling them at actions, raping them at will, and destroying the community in which they have lived for countless generations. We Yazidi are deeply uh, appreciate the recognition of the genocide, the first out of the 74. Now, I will bring my thoughts to the distinguished audience. Talking about coexisting in the Middle East, you can never skip the Yazidi topic. And here is why. In the last seven centuries, the number of Yazidis from 20 million went down to less than 1 million today. Only in 18th century, Yazidi went through 15 genocides. And today, Yazidi, and today ISIS actually stated in their public documents that God will not will hold Muslims accountable for allowing the Yazidi to have remained in the Middle East for this long. The recognition of the genocide is great, but what is the next step? Do we have any specific law that will protect Yazidi in and other minority in that region? How deep the international community is involved or dedicated to save Yazidis in Muslim regions? Do Yazidi have a re uh, future in, in that region? Hundreds of Yazidi found their death in Mediterranean Sea in order to seek the safe haven for themselves in Europe. I was at the conference organized by Washington Institute for Near East Policy. One of the participants uh, who introduced himself uh, from Iraqi military stated that Yazidi believe in evil. I wasn't surprised. His statement may be very meaningless here in America, but in Middle East, it has totally different reality. For instance, a few weeks ago, was beheaded in Azerbaijan in Artsakh for the war attack. So that raised another question in the modern world. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Lucy Osoyan. Uh, now we will have a speech uh, from Mr. Khalaf Saleh Faris Ali, which would be read by Mr. Ardar Mitani. Mr. Mitani, please. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'd like to thank you for giving us this precious chance to be a voice for our people. It would have been an honor for me to attend the conference and deliver my message in person, but unfortunately our passports have been confiscated by the security forces of Kurdistan Democratic Party led by Mr. Barzani. And that's why we could not attend the conference. The minorities in the Middle East have been disenfranchised and have been suffering for a long time evidenced by the massacres they have been subjugated to. The last massacre was Islamic State's genocide against Yazidis and other minorities, minority groups in North Iraq. Today, these minorities in the area are under the risk of extermination because those who are responsible for their protection do not protect them unless it aligns with their short-term interests as the ter terrible events that happened to Azidis in Shangal on August 3rd, 2014 show. We are a minority facing genocide. Thousands of our women, children were taken as captives, sold into slavery. Our people were butchered and thrown into tens of mass graves. After the failure of the Iraqi government and Kurdistan regional government to protect and defend us for a few hours, we see it as our, as, our right, as our right to head to the international community and ask them to stand on our side and support us until we get our political, administrative, economic, security, social, cultural, 
and cultural rights according to the Iraqi constitution and international laws and, and charters. We are in complete awareness that if we are not responsible for our security and administration, we cannot live in our homeland freely. This request of ours should be under international protection because the Azidis lost the trust in Peshmerga after they left hundreds of thousands of civilians helpless to ISIL on 3rd of August 2014. In the light of this, we formed the Shangal Resistance Units, YDS, and Shangal Women Units in these forces are now part of the Iraqi Armed Forces. Our forces have a great role to prevent the mercenaries of Islamic State to climb the mountain Sinjar, in which thousands of Yazidis live, as well as in securing the liberation of Shangal and the areas around it. The duty of YDS, YDS and YJS is to protect Shangal and its people. Also, we formed a self-administration council from the people who stayed in the Sinjar Mountain and fought ISIL. The, the aim of the council is to be starting point for self-governance in, governance in Shangal. According to federal constitution of Iraq, so on 14th of January 2015, a conference was held and 27 members, including men and women, taking gender equality as a basis, were elected and divided into six committees. committees. These are diplomatic, security, youth, women's affairs, service, and financial committees. The council is able to deliver food and other services to the people who live in Sinjar Mountain and around it monthly in coordination with the government of Al Jazeera Canton, which is Rojava government. Our council takes pluralism, secularism, democracy, and coexistence as a basis. During this short period of time, the self-administration council was able to build good diplomatic relations with the Iraqi government and other countries, as well as international organizations. On behalf of the Council and the Azidi, Azidi people who stayed on the Sinjar Mountain since August 3rd, 2014, we plead to the United States of America, United Nations, and the European Union and the following. One, doing more to liberate the kidnapped Azidis and we have to pay them. Two, recognizing what happened to Yazidis on 3rd of August 2014 as a genocide and urging the United Nations to ask the International Criminal Court to open an investigation on the case, especially after the resolution of EU February 4th, 2016, the recognition of American Con Congress on March 14, 2016, as well as the State Department on March 17, 2016, and the recognition of the case by the British Parliament on April 14, 2016. Third, as Shangal resistance units are, are an Iraqi force, we plead to the U USA to train and supply this force in coordination with Iraqi government as they do in other parts of Iraq. Supporting the religious minorities in North Iraq to get their political, administrative, economic, social, cultural, and educational rights in federal Iraq. This is according to the articles 116, 119, 120, and 121 of the Iraqi Constitution and is also according to the United Nations Charter Chapter 11, Article 73 and 76. Five, providing an inter international protection for the Nineveh Plain and Shengal. Six, encouraging international companies to participate in reconstruction of Shengal. Seven, coaching the political parties in Shengal to not use the Azidi issue for their political interest, but their efforts together for Azidi people and help them. Eight, bringing the perpetrators of the Azidi genocide to justice. Khalid Saleh, Director of External Relations, Self-Administrative Council of Shengal. Thank you. Once again, thank you, Dr. Philip, for your dramatical speech. Indeed, 
must also help with your short and sweet speech. And Mr. Khalaf is informative the speech read by Mr. Mitali. Now we have about 15 minutes for Q&A session. If you would please uh, raise your hand so we can get your name and answer whatever question you have. Dr. Rahmani. Mr. Kurdi. Name, please. Sanasha. 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 Jahan Badri. Jahan Badri. One more. Kaya. Okay. We begin with Ms. Uh, Mr. Dawar, last one. We begin with Dr. Rahmani. Over there. I have a comment and a question for Professor Philip. Uh, first, I want to thank you, the K Kurdish Political Research Center, for bringing all these eloquent speakers and uh, but I have also um, Kurt from Rojavat and I represent Kurt from Rojavat. They sent me here particularly that uh, tell you that last time we checked we are Kurds too. So uh, and we are 12 million almost combined Kurds of Rojava and, Roj and Bashur Iraq. So, uh, but we have been neglected. Anyway, so also I have a question for Dr. Philip. Uh, you mentioned about the situation in Iraq and the uh, decentralization of uh, Iraq. Um, I have done extensive studies there and I have been there many, many times. And what is, what my question is, there is one part of the equation that I guess you didn't mention, but I'd like you to elaborate on that, that how much the role of the Iranian government is important. Because as far as I know, based on my research, is uh, there are at least 48 different Shia trained by Iranian organization and militias in active, active, active in Iraq, and there are seven more than seven hundred sleeping cells of Iranian people government in Soleimania. So much so that Can people. Can I interrupt you there yeah. for just a moment? So I have a flight that I have to catch back to New York. I know. My question is, you did not mention that part of the equation for liberation of Kurds in Iraq. So maybe we can take the other questions quickly, and if you make them questions, I'll take them. Any questions for Dr. Phillips, please? Uh, Mr. Kurdi? Dr. Phillips will be leaving, so if you have any questions for you, please go ahead and ask. Yeah, Dr. Phillips, my name is Father Kurdi. I am leading one of the NGOs here, Kurdistan Aid. From time to time, actually on a monthly basis, I'm teaching at the State Department and Department of Defense for those people that are leaving U.S. go to overseas. Um, to go back to the independence um, referendum in KIG, Kurdistan, Iraq. Um, the structure of Iraqi Kurdistan. If you uh, work on the uh, referendum over independence, I, no matter what, every single Kurd is dreaming about the, uh, about the independence. But uh, here's the question, or here's the, the comment. Every single political structure or state structure has to be built on a base on security and stability. 
In KID, security and stability is based on a two militias. It is not based on the structure of the of the government. You, sorry to interrupt you. Would you please ask your question? I, I have a comment, Sir Connor. Once 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 you have a baseline, you have you have to have a couple of pillars to put on these bases, and then you can put your roof on it. One pillar is rule of law. There is no single rule of law in KIG. Number two is uh, uh, governance. Uh, actually, I can say that there is also no governance in KRG. And economic development, as we speak today, tomatoes and cucumber, comes from the neighboring, neighbor, neighboring country. Uh, if you owe $20 billion on your oil revenue or, or on, on, on the economy, on which base you are going to do referendum and self rule self rule could start. Okay. That's my question. I have a I have a question also for after comment for Miss Lucy. Oh, Excuse me. If you have a comment or go to it, let those people who have questions come forward please because you will be leaving. Uh, pretty, please. I'll get back to you. Yeah. Yes, you can decide. Question, please, and make it clear and concise. Okay. Thank you. My question is to uh, Dr. Phillips. Uh, do you see, from your perspective, any slowdown uh, within the U.S. government against? YPG, YPJ, PYD, or overall the Kurdish issue. Because yesterday uh, I uh, listened to uh, Senator Graham, and I really did not like what he's talking about. And also, what do you see about uh, the future potential presidential candidates uh, and their views regarding Kurdish issue? We have also another question from Mr. Hilla. <laughs> My question will be for Dr. Phillips. Don Don from uh, Kurdish People's Congress. Uh, Dr. Phillips, all the four divided uh, and occupied Kurdistan. Which part, uh, the solution for which part do you find most complex? And what is your uh, view, if you, could, if you could elaborate on the solution of Kurdish people? Kurdish conflict in Turkey specifically. Thank you so much. So let me try to answer those questions before I uh, make a mad dash to the airport. Uh, yes, Iraqi Kurdistan needs to develop its state structure, it needs to improve its governance. We established a task force on state building in Iraqi Kurdistan that I directed, it was led by Ambassador Nancy Soderberg, other notables were involved. I would refer you to that because in the areas of governance, security, economy, and the humanitarian crisis, we explored in great detail what needs to be done. As a matter of principle, Iraqi Kurdistan will receive more support if it functions and acts like a legitimate state. It's taken big steps in that regard since I first visited in 1992. There's more that has to be done. So what's the most complex problem? Clearly the most complex problem for the Kurds concerns Turkey. Turkey has been a NATO ally. The U.S. is in a bit of a conundrum. It doesn't want to be put in a situation where it has to choose between Turkey and the Kurds. Increasingly, the Kurds are demonstrating their great value to the U.S., not only on the battlefield, but also because Kurds and Americans share values. And as I said often, because Turkey is increasingly Islamist, authoritarian, and anti-Western, if NATO were being established today, Turkey would not meet the criteria for membership. On the role of Iran, we talk a lot about Kurds in other countries. We often forget about the Kurds in Iran. We also don't address the influence of Iran in the region. We should recall that 
during the period leading up to the Iraq War of 2003. All the Kurdish parties had headquarters in Tehran. The first planes to land in Erbil after the attack by ISIS were not US C-130s, there were Iranian transports. So Iran bears considerable influence and its influence shouldn't be ignored. Since the US and Iran now have entered into formal cooperation through the nuclear accord, there should be efforts to explore other areas of cooperation between Tehran and Washington, including on regional issues, such as Kurdish concerns. The last question had to do with presidential candidates. Now, I'm not really able to address this, except to say that none of the presidential <coughs> candidates want to be talking about Kurdish issues or Iraqi Kurdistan now. And there's a reason for that, because there's nothing good to talk about. But I promise you that as soon as the president-elect shifts from being a candidate to having a transitional policy planning process, the first topic on their list of concerns will be the potential declaration of independence by Iraqi Kurdistan and critical political and security decisions that the U.S. has to make. So for now, I don't think we're going to learn much from the candidates about their views, but events will require them to have a policy towards Iraqi Kurdistan. So we'll see during the transition period between November and January exactly where they stand. To the extent that we can raise our voices at conferences like this, in other forums, in the media, through what we publish, the ideas that we share, we have the opportunity to shape U.S. policy, I can tell you that over the past years, the U.S. has clearly developed a greater level of sympathy and cooperation with the Kurds in the region. I salute the heroic defenders of Kobani for what they did there. And let's not forget that the defenders of Kobani were Kurds across the region, from Iran, they were Peshmerga, they were YPG and they were PKK. And the U.S. provided weapons and air support. So clearly, U.S. policy is evolving. The decision to provide direct budgetary support to the Peshmerga announced last week is a measure of that shift. If we keep working together, if we keep raising our voices, if we keep organizing, we're going to see this policy continue to evolve. And I'm grateful to all of you for your efforts, for being here. It's an honor for me to participate, and I apologize for my departure, but I have my family waiting for me in New York. I'm obligated to return, so I will leave the discussion to you all. So thank you. I want to apologize to those of you who have questions or perhaps more comments with regard to addressing it to Dr. Phillips. He, as you heard him, he has a fire obligation he has to live, but uh, the Q&A will go on for a few more minutes. If you have any question, this is a Q&A Q session. The priority goes to questions. And then if you have comments, that would be fine. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um. I thank you so much. Um, I promise I'll keep this short and sweet. I'm sorry. With all due respect, Mr. Kraman Jigundi, to describe our sister here, Lucy's speech um, about the rape, sexual slavery, and like massacre of a ZD woman as short and sweet is not only an insult to Lucy, but to all the women in this room and to all the women, especially all the ZD women here who are suffering under the torture of ISIS still. It's also an, an incredible.
incredibly patronizing and patriarchal comments as her as a woman. And quite frankly, I think you owe Lucy and all the women in this room an apology. Excuse me. I apologize to you and to Lucy and to everyone in this room. And by all means, that was not the intention of what I said with uh, addressing to her speech short and sweet, not to the country, but honestly to the time, uh, which I was concerned. Uh, once more, I apologize to not only women, but everyone and this, uh, everyone in this room and everyone who hear about this behind, beyond this room, and certainly to our fellow Yazidis. Uh, yes, sir. The care of uh, Yazidi, uh, it is taken wrong. Uh, Yazidis, you just mentioned about four or five thousand women being taken by slaves by the Sunnis. If we continue to call them Yazidis, we'll open an opportunity for Shias to come and take another four or five thousand people or women slaves. Yazidis are wrong term. You have to correct them to Yazidis. They are Yazidis, not Yazidis. Thank you. To uh, Uh, again, being Armenian, I will ask Ms. Lucy, uh, how do the Yazidis or Yazidis treat in Armenia? Are they like same what they treat in other regions? Is this anything special in Armenia for Yazidis? In Soviet Union, we were called ACB as well. So uh, that's exactly the problem that we all face because of that wrong determination. We have faced so many genocides, and I wouldn't be surprised if there is any upcoming in the future. So uh, in Armenia, ACB has been treated well. Um, I've mentioned about the ACB soldier that has been beheaded in Armenia, uh, Artsakh in Azerbaijan attack recently. Number one, he was my family member. Number two is that we in Zibi have been fighting with Armenia back to back for the freedom of our Armenian Republic because we were allowed to stay in Armenia for over a century uh, when we came from Ottomans. And so we share the same thing and we do feel uh, safe and we are brothers. Every very personal historical sources, it is the study actually is godly religion, and by all means, the content of religious, uh, of Yazidi religion or Yazdani religion is the most peaceful religion in the entire region, certainly when you compare with these organized religion, religions. And there are a lot of misunderstanding about Yazidi religions, unfortunately. And again, unfortunately, the Kurdish administration has taken little or no steps to clear up this misunderstanding about um, the Yazidi religions and also the importance of, of Yazidi culture to, uh, to the Kurdish culture, to the Kurdistani culture as a whole. Uh, we will be taking, what was your question? Mr. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Mr. Badri, John Badri, yeah. last question. <coughs> well, I have to pursue more for Lucy, but okay. I'm going to ask that. Uh, so, the question is for Ms. Lucy. Uh, there was an article on Newsday, I think, two, three days ago. Uh, uh, about the KRD involvement in the whole, in the whole uh, uh, Yazidi's conflict and whole Yazidi's struggle, the KRD involvement in ISIS. And we know that there's been a lot of, you know, 
it complains about how they approach the issue and how they kind of somehow facilitate the issue. So would you please make a comment on the whole KRG's approach towards that massacre? But I would say the KRG term is very broad. We have a lot of friends. Uh, we have also people who we don't know how to describe. So what I was trying to explain, the Yazidism is described as the evil worshippers in the Middle East. In, whole. in the Muslim Brotherhood, it will be very dangerous for us, for ourselves to coexist. So we trying to raise our voice to call for Autonomy, or for you know some sort of green area where we can stay safe and coexist safe, because thousands of these hundreds of thousands of these are fleeing, and they wanted to leave. They want to go to Europe. In that case, we will lose our identity, and it is historically important for us to be there. So uh, PRG, you know, it, it's difficult for me to describe or answer that question. I rather not instead because. I'm not from from PRG. <laughs> I, I I grew up in different areas, so it's difficult. I'm sorry. Yeah. 